morning. <clears throat> Go ahead and open your Bibles to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And um, if you guys were here last Sunday, you know that uh, we've been looking in the book of James last Sunday. Uh, we talked about patience, we talked about the mouth, all from the book of James. And I went back through all the sermons I had preached um, online, and I was looking and noticed that there's just a few more passages from James I haven't preached from. So I decided to finish it out. So that's what we're going to do this morning for the devotion period here at 9 a.m. And then secondly, for the uh, 1045 worship period, something like that, 1030, 1045. Um, so we're going to be looking at James chapter 5 today. And I cannot remember where I heard it, but I heard a parable one time, and it goes something like this. A fly was buzzing around, and it saw this nice strip of gooey fly paper hanging there on the ceiling. And so it goes to this fly paper, and not seeing a challenger in sight, it falls on this fly paper and screams, oh, my fly paper. And it's looking there, and it's sumpt you know, just sumptuously uh, ravenous over this fly paper. It's digging its face into it. It's sucking and slurping. It's so happy. And unfortunately, uh, as time goes on, it decides it wants to leave. And beginning to beat its wings helplessly, it starts to pull away, and it finds it can't. And all of a sudden, the fly paper screams, oh, my fly. And you think about this parable, and it sort of demonstrates, I guess, kind of our relationship with possessions, if you think about it that way. That sometimes we get excited about the various blessings that God brings into our life and not really thinking about how to wisely use them, not knowing that it all comes with a warning inscription on the box. We just feast sumptuously without thinking about how to wisely live with our riches, with our money, with our possessions. Our possessions cry out even louder than we do, my human at times. And what's great about James and why I think it's actually a lot of people's favorite book in the New Testament, I've heard this from multiple people, oh, I love James, is because James is a wisdom writer. Okay, a lot of people like Proverbs. When they open up their Bible, a lot of times what they need to get started in the morning is to read a chapter of Proverbs. They love it because it's practical, right? Like, spare me all the mumbo jumbo, just give me something to do. Well, James is kind of like that. James is just filled with wisdom for how to live in this world today. And something he tells us about is how to live wisely with possessions. I once heard it put sometime, there's, there's such a great danger in it if we're not wise about it, especially when you consider that. We live in one of the wealthiest nations to ever grace God's green earth. I heard it put one time that if a penny will block, will blind you from the largest star in the galaxy if you hold it close enough to your eye. And that's kind of the point. So let's talk about this perils of the penny. And we're going to do it with three points, hopefully. It really depends on how long I like to speak. But uh, I might get to the third point. I'm not entirely sure if we will or not. Um, but uh, we'll definitely try to get through the first two points at least anyway. All right? So let's start with the first point, James chapter 5. Hopefully many of you are already turned there in your Bible. And I'm just going to start reading in verse 1. So James 5, beginning verse 1. Let's see what happens here. Come now, you rich... Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and the corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury, luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person, and he does not resist you. Now, the first thing to take notice, and this is very important, is that James isn't speaking to Christians in this passage, okay? Contextually, every time James uses the phrase, the rich, he's really talking about the unconverted rich. He's talking about those people who are in the high levels of society, 
who are abusing and misusing the Christians who serve them. That's really what he's talking about here. But this is the climax of the atrocities of the rich. What does he say that they've, they've done? He says that they have oppressed, they're guilty of corruption, arrogance, injustice, oppression, persecution, they've cheated their workers, they lived in indifferent indulgence and even condemned and murdered the innocent. And what James is saying is that it's basically inappropriate in light of where we are in the grand history of things, in light of living in the last days, it's inappropriate to just be hoarding all of this wealth when we consider the fading glory of the rich and what God is seeking to do in the world. And this is, I don't know if you guys notice this, but this is particularly frightening, frightening to me in the text. Did you guys look at verse four? Look at it one more time. The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. And the cries have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. But let me tell you something. Anytime you read the word cry in your Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, those are some dangerous words. Because we go back to the idea of Abel's blood, right? Which cried out against Cain and his injustice against his brother. We think about Genesis 18, where the Lord is walking with Abraham and he's debating within himself whether he's going to let Abraham in on what he's going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says there's been this great outcry against the grave sins of Sodom, right? Or you think about Moses in Exodus chapter three, where it's told that the cries of all the slaves had reached the ears of God and he was going to deliver them. And here, it's not just the Lord who hears the cries. But did you notice it says the Lord of hosts? What does that mean? Like, we don't, we don't talk that way unless it's in some ancient hymn that we're singing, right? The Lord of hosts, what is that? The Lord of hosts means the Lord of the heavenly armies. The myriads and myriads of spiritual beings that he has in his power. That's the one who hears the cries. And he will hear it. And he will answer. Listen to me. I know that he's not talking necessarily to Christians here, but is there any way in which our life do you think that we can transfer from a rich Christian to just sort of superficially being a Christian to more just being the oppressive rich? Is there any time in history where we've seen that happen to people, where riches have begun to be, to be corrosive to spiritual character and have corroded the people and their priorities to God? I'm certain that we can think of many, right? I mean, that's sort of almost a, a sort of trite, pithy saying by these days, right? It's sort of a cliche idea. When we look at riches, it can corrupt people. And the way that the Bible presents it is that we can either be hurting or helping with our material possessions. There's really no in-between, right? You're either hurting people with your possessions or you're helping them with your possessions. There is no middle. And indifference towards the needy is sinful. If we think that it's an exaggeration or that this is a real danger, just, look, just think about anybody in history. I think about one example of Marie Antoinette, right? You think about the French Revolution that started with her extravagance, with her decadence, and not caring for the plight of the poor, eventually saying, let them eat cake, right? Like the, 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 the flagrant indifference of this woman. I, uh, some of you guys know that I, I recently went to um, Israel with uh, Caleb. And it was a really, it was kind of an amazing learning experience. And one of the things that we did was we traveled the entire span of Israel from the north to the south. And running along the span of Israel, for those of you who are geography nerds, right? When you look at the span of Israel, there is the Jordan River, which just flows north to south. And there are two major bodies of water, at least today, two major bodies of water that lie on this Jordan River, running north to south in Israel. The first one is in the north, and it's the Sea of Galilee. Yes, it's a boat in the Sea of Galilee. And it's the Sea of Galilee, it's in the north, it's beautiful, it's, it's, it's fresh. We got to ride a boat across it, it's wonderful. Uh, many of Jesus' miracles and his teachings happen in and around this area, Capernaum, Nazareth, all these places, right? And it's teeming with life. I mean, people fish on it to this day. It's a gorgeous, beautiful uh, body of water. Now we travel to the south and we have this long strip of water and it's called the Dead Sea. Two bodies of water, on the Jordan River. And if you think about the Jordan River, we got there. Um, it's kind of interesting uh, whenever you go there. 
you look at it from your hotel and it looks beautiful. It, look, it looks amazing. It's, it's gorgeous. Like in the middle of all of this desert area, there's this body of water, right? But you go down to it and you begin to realize that there's something kind of strange about this water. As you're walking, all of a sudden the ground gets really hard and crackly and, and you notice that there's all these salt crystals everywhere. And as you get closer to the water, you touch the water and you notice, oh, this doesn't exactly feel like water. Doesn't exactly feel like water. This feels like I just dipped my hand in a vat of oil or something. Or like, like you got a sandwich from Portillo's, right? Like it's just, just completely covering your hand. Like I need to watch this off immediately. You guys know what I'm talking about. Now, the reason why is because the salt content in the Dead Sea is so high that nothing can live in it. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. And when you think about these two bodies of water, I'm making a point here. When you think about these two bodies of water, do you know what's the difference between them? between this body of water that's filled with life, teeming with life, and the Dead Sea, is that one has an outlet. One can receive from the same source all of this water, the Sea of Galilee, and let it out. And it stays alive and it stays fresh. The Dead Sea only receives. It only brings in. It only fills up. It never has an outlet. And that's the reason why it's the Dead Sea. And a same point can be made for our possessions. But the Bible talks about it is more blessed to give than to receive. And whenever we allow this to receive, sometimes if we're not consistently pouring forth an output, it can change our characters and we can become corrupt. That's what we have to think about with what James is saying here. And he says that judgment is coming. That's what he says in verse 5. We're like this oblivious cow, he imagines, right? Just gorging ourselves. And we don't realize that it will be the well-fed, so to speak, who are readying themselves for the knife. The more we indulge, the closer the butcher comes. How would we live differently if we understood that reality? Here's the second point. So not only the perils of persecution that comes from the rich, but now we talk about the peril of presumption, all right? So just turn a page over to chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 13, all right? Chapter 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, what is James talking about here? Now, I will say this. This time he is not talking about non-Christians, the oppressive rich. Here he is talking about Christians, Christian business men and women, business people, people who are going out to do business as Christians. And another pitfall the rich businessmen were falling into was that of presumption, that assuming that they, in fact, were in control of the direction of their lives, that riches often lead to this weird delusion that we live into, that, that we're the ultimate controller of our lives. It gives us false sense of control and stability and safety and security. And it's truly unmerited, James says. It can lead us to this arrogant assurance of stability in our lives. Leads us into this type of independence from God. Kind of like we're growing into an adult, we don't need to rely on our parents anymore, right? Like, I got money, don't worry about it. But think about it. Having a, a fat bank account and the savings or, or businesses thriving, for example, all that gives us is peace and security. Why? You know why you feel good whenever you got money in the bank? Because you trust in that, Right? You depend on that. And every day we're trying to exert some more control over our lives. Did you notice what he says when he gives us this hypothetical situation of this person who is going to another town to, to spend a year there and to sell and trade? Notice that they're exerting control over a time and over a place and over a goal. It's this over preoccupation with providing for yourself. You don't have to be rich to be materialistic. You don't have to. You don't, you don't have to overspend to be materialistic. We often think that way. Well, like, oh, that person's buying stuff for themselves all the time. They're materialistic, right? But in fact, you can actually be frugal and materialistic. I once had a lady comment on Facebook, and I want to quote her. 
so that was good. She says, I guess the long and the short is that money can be as big an idol when you seek not to spend it as when you do nothing but spend it. Frugality in and of itself must not be an end of itself, but must be a means to a greater end of bringing glory to God and serving others. It's that outlet. It's being the Sea of Galilee and not the Dead Sea, right? If that is your end, is to bless others in the name of God, then you will be blessed. Now, planning and investments are not wrong. That's not what I'm saying, right? I don't think that's what James is saying. But he is saying that there is a way to carry on with your business that is distinctly unchristian, that is no different than a world, in other words, that, that your faith has zero influence on how you do business. And James calls that arrogance, the arrogance that assumes we're the ultimate boss of our lives, and so we make these plans totally independent of God. You think, for example, of the parable of the rich fool. Jesus is standing there, and in Luke chapter 12, someone comes over here, and I don't know what kind of view he must have had of Jesus to ask him this question, but he says, Lord, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And he says, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he talks about this man who his crops had come in, he was a very rich man, he, he built his barns, they were filled to the brim, and he said, what shall I do now, right? I'm so rich, I got more stock coming in, what shall I do? I know what I'll do, I'll tell down my barns, and build greater. And God comes to him that night and says, fool, you don't even know that your life is required of you this very moment. He was a fool. Why? Because he was thoughtless of God, and it resulted in him living a life empty of God. So here's James's prescription for that kind of heart. He gives us three facts. Number one, did you notice this? He gives us three facts to confront this idea. He says, number one, your ignorant. Do you see that in verse 14? Look in your Bible. I want you to see it with your own eyes. He says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You have no idea what's going on with your health. You have no idea if your heart is in a healthy state. You have no idea what tomorrow may bring, whether a drunk driver will swerve into your lane, you have no idea how many years you have left on this earth. You have zero clue. He says, number two, not only do you not know, but did you notice that he says that your life is like a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes away? He says, not only that, but you're frail. You don't know, but you're also frail. You're not even that strong, dude. Your, your body is made mainly of water, right? <laughs> That's dangerous to assume that you're not frail. And then finally he says, instead you ought to say in verse 15, if the Lord wills. He says, you don't realize that every single breath that comes in and out of your lungs is a breath of grace from God. You are dependent upon him, and therefore you should say, Lord willing. There needs to be this overwhelming humility in your life that only comes from accepting that God is always present and in control, and every second is of his grace. And here's another thing. I've seen people take the application of this sermon and go away saying, Lord willing, Lord willing, Lord willing, Lord willing. We'll get pizza today, Lord willing. You know, and they, they, they add like Lord willing to everything, right? He's not talking about lip service and just saying Lord willing. He's not talking about lip service, keeping up vain repetitions as the heathen do. He's not saying that. What does it mean to live against the reality that truly we will accomplish this if God is so willing? It's not just lip service. It's actually living in this humble way, not saying, Lord willing, when you're acting out, my will be done, but giving thought to how would God will your business to be run? How would God will for you to operate in the workplace? How would God will for you to use your money? That's the point. Oh, lo and behold, I, I do have time. This is good. <laughs> Thirdly, here's the last point. We're going to James chapter 1 this time as we talk about the peril of pride. So not just the peril of persecution, not just the peril of presumption, but also the peril of pride. Now, James, we're, we're hopping all around James because the reason why James is considered a wisdom writer is that sometimes his thoughts are not that 
they don't have a consistent flow. Kind of like when you read Proverbs, they sort of jump around topics in multiple chapters. James does that too. And James mentions this idea of money in many different chapters. And his very first thought actually comes in chapter one. And we'll start reading in verse nine this time. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and let the rich in his humiliation because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. The last comment I have is just to think about this mind-shattering reality that James gives us depending on our particular circumstance in life, okay? So think about what he's asking us to do. Basically, I think anyone would agree that he's saying instead of being prideful, be humbled, right? But think deeper about what exactly he's saying. Like, ask the question, why would a poor person rejoice in exaltation? Like, if, if, you're, if you're poor, you don't necessarily feel like you're exalted, no? You don't, you don't necessarily feel like you're on top of the world. So why would you rejoice in exaltation? And why, if you are on top of the world, if you are rich, would you rejoice in your humiliation? Like, why would anyone do that? That doesn't make sense to me. The reason why is because James is operating on the basis of a different reality. And it's the reality that comes as a result of understanding how the world has changed on the basis of the cross. That in other words, the cross means everything is different now in the eyes of God. Everything has been transformed. The way that the world uh, has, has given us a standard of, of right and wrong and good and evil and, 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 and good and bad and so forth, all of that has been turned on its head with Jesus Christ. Because the cross radically redefines our standards and what is valuable. It brings reality to light like putting on those blue and red lens 3D glasses you guys got in like a cereal box, right? It helps you to see things as they are. Everything's different now. The church is where the valleys are made high and the mountains are made low, where the roles are reversed and all things are equal. Because in the cross, the rich receive the message that though they are rich, nothing they could have done could ever earn them a place in heaven, ever, at the kingdom, no way. And the poor receive the message that though they are poor, they have been richly provided and afforded a seat in the palace, all on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. James says in chapter two and verse five, that God has chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, a kingdom he has promised to all those who love him. Heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That reality is made possible because Jesus. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus that though he is rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Everything is turned on its head. And so we allow the gospel to humble us and to recognize our true state before God. And if we are rich, and we are, I know being rich is a relative term. <laughs> Tyler, I'm not rich. I'm actually scared to look at my bank account right now, okay? You have no idea. Listen to me. We live in the richest nation in the world. We're rich compared to the rest of the world. And we need to think about being Christians and being a blessing to the world around us in our society, being like the Sea of Galilee and not like the Dead Sea. Please pray with me and then uh, we'll have a scripture reading before our Bible classes. Our Father in heaven, it's really difficult to hear your teachings about riches. Father, we grow afraid whenever we think about the words of Jesus that Truly, it is difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But Father, we know that with you, all things are possible. And you can transform our hearts through the gospel into a heart of generosity and radical giving. Father, help us to look at opportunities around us to be giving, and not just with our money, but with our time, with our hearts, with our advice, with our counseling. 
And with our money, when the need arises, Father, help us to be a blessing to all those in the world that ultimately people might see our light shine and so glorify you in heaven. Father, help us to do it for your glory. Make us living, teeming with life because we have an open hand. Father, please help us in this repentance and help us to make much out of your name. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture reading this morning is 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. It's on page 256 in the Pew Bible. That's 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine, his name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head in the head of <laughs> Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul your father to his brothers, to his friends, and I have not given you into the hands of David. And yet you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner and more also if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom of the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Now we can be dismissed to our classes. visiting here with us. We hope that you felt welcome with our family here at Brownsburg. We know that we are happy uh, to have you here. We hope that your needs are met and that your soul is stirred. I had this passage I wanted to share with you guys that I read this morning, and I found it encouraging whenever we just stop for a moment to think about what it is that we do here and why do we do it. And this passage says thus, assemble the people, the men, the women, and the little ones, and the sojourner within your towns that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. And that is Deuteronomy 31. What we're doing here is not an unimportant, typical ritual that Christians follow throughout the week. We are gathering as the identified people of God to do what people of God have always done, and that is to reverently sit underneath the word and to learn to fear him. Please bow with me in prayer as we begin this lesson. Father, we love you. And we want just for a moment for you to take thought of us. We have been singing, we have been praying, we have been meditating on your word, we have been rejoicing in the supper of the Lamb. Father, we're thankful for all the ways in which you draw us into yourself. For a moment, Father, we beg you that you would help us to remember you. Help us to see what changes can happen in our lives when we begin to remember you in our homes, when we begin to remember you in our families, when we begin to remember you in our schools, in our jobs. Father, Bless your name and help us to remember you at this hour. Please, almighty God, grace us with your Holy Spirit to transform us more and more into the image of your Son. Help us to hunger and the thirst for righteousness. And Father, as you have promised, help us to be filled now. For this we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. 
Okay, so uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to James chapter 3. I made mention of this uh, at the beginning of our devotion service at 9 o'clock, that we were finishing and wrapping up some lessons in James. Kind of to go along with what we talked about last week, because if you remember, we, we spoke about James exclusively. We're doing that today. And here we're going to talk about a little lesson I call wisdom from above. So we're going to try to see if we can understand the biblical concept of wisdom. And I think wisdom is something that we all want, right? I think that uh, especially, you know, right after you make an awful mistake, we want wisdom. We want to learn what that is about. But the question that we have to deal with right now is what is wisdom? Because there's a lot of definitions for that. So let's sort of harness our aim just a little bit and understand what is biblical wisdom. I asked Isaac one time, actually, I don't know if I asked it, it might have been Amber. I, I steal all of her stories and make them mine anyway, right? So it might have been me, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I think Amber was actually asking Isaac, what is wisdom? And uh, he replied, being old, right? And that's, of course, one way we could go with it, that wisdom is just being old. But we, we're, we're obsessed with this idea of wisdom, and there are many ways that we can define it. Timothy Keller says that wisdom is knowing what to do in the 80% of life situations where the moral rules don't apply. That we know wisdom is less this concrete rule and more of this sort of nebulous idea of how to behave in the moment. You think about various symbols that we have used for wisdom throughout history. We think about the owl, right? The owl was a symbol of wisdom. Um, and this goes all the way back to Roman history. When we look at the goddess Minerva, she was a god of wisdom, and an owl was a symbol for wisdom. We think about uh, Winnie the Pooh, and we think of characters like Piglet and Eeyore. Of course, we think about the owl. He had the answers. Uh, Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Right? That's what we think about. And do you know why? Why, 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 do, we, why do we equate the owl with wisdom? Because the Romans knew that owls can see in the dark, right? That's what wisdom is, the ability to know the answer when other people don't know it. Now, the Bible enters into this picture of wisdom, and it begins just to kind of color it a little bit differently as the Bible usually does. That wisdom is a little more than that. That wisdom, biblical wisdom, is a different sort of character. And so let's look at the biblical idea of wisdom from James chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. And you'll notice, for those of you who were here, especially last Sunday, that this comes right in the wake of the text we read about the tongue, right? And about these teachers and the division that was being caused by the tongue there in the church that uh, James is speaking to. So here's what it says. Verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy, jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the beginning of wisdom for us. We have two points this morning. Point number one is what wisdom is, or what I call the fruit of wisdom, right? We want to just dig our fingers in and begin to caress wisdom and kind of get a feel for what it is. And then in point number two, we want to step back and say, okay, we understand it. How do we get it, right? So how, the origin of wisdom, in other words, in point number two. So let's start with point number one, the fruit of wisdom. What is it? The first thing we have to do is we have to place what James is saying about wisdom in verses 13 through 18 in its proper context. Because if you look at James chapter 3, verses 1 and 12, you notice that he begins with this injunction, let not many of you become teachers, brothers. And the reason why is because as is becoming clearly evident, these individuals who were youngsters in the faith, I guess, and think that they know a little thing or two about the spiritual faith come in and they begin wanting to teach. And their words have been so divisive that it's worked like a crowbar are to just wedge the church into different factions. That's the problem that they're dealing with in their day. 
Today, I don't know, it might not necessarily be that. Today, the problem might be divisiveness in the political sphere. I mean, my goodness, if we just put our pulse, uh, or put our fingers to the pulse for a second, we recognize that our political climate is extremely divisive. Whether you're talking about, and it's really on both sides, whether you're talking about the new orthodoxy on the left side that has risen, and now if you exclaim any sort of position that is different from that orthodoxy, they nail you down as a bigot, or the response to that with the alt-right, where we have individuals even taking violence, right, in the name of conservatism. We have this immense division all over the place, and I think a lot of us are, are getting sick of it. What are we doing in that moment to have wisdom? Do we have that heavenly wisdom when we're constantly breathing this atmosphere of division? Let me suggest three things that wisdom is really quickly from this text that, that James points out. The first thing is that wisdom is divided. Now, I don't mean that it's divided in the sense, well, we're trying to avoid division, right, Tyler? So where's this coming from? He's pointing out the fact that it's very easy to latch on to a certain kind of wisdom that is not the biblical version of wisdom. In other words, he says that there is this heavenly wisdom from above, he says, and this earthly wisdom from below. And he says not to confuse the two. He says worldly wisdom looks like bitter jealousy, he says, and selfish ambition. And you, probably like me, were asking, well, that's not really wisdom, James. That's just sin, right? <laughs> but the reason why he calls it wisdom is because it looks out for number one. It comes into this world, and because it knows it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, it looks out for number one. It's rooted in itself. It knows how to rub other people a certain way to promote your own well-being and success in life. This comes from demons, James says. It's demonic. But then he contrasts that with this idea of heavenly wisdom. This wisdom, he says, from above. And on the contrary, it's not self-centered. It's not about yourself. It's other-centered. Look how he describes it. He says, it's one who's pure in their morals who seeks peace with gentle dealings with people. It's, it's willing to yield and, and to reason, right? It's willing to stop and, and think about its own perspective. It's, it's merciful, it's fair, it's genuine. This one, the wise one, is one who promotes this unity and relationship and life everywhere they go to flourish, home, church, work, wherever it is. They bring about the best in people and promote unity. It makes peace. That doesn't come from anything you learn yourself on this earth. It's not earthly. It's not demonic. The second thing he says there is that wisdom is behavioral. Wisdom is behavioral. What's the point that James is making in verse 13? He says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. By his good conduct. In other words, just like James says in James chapter 2, when he talks about you have a man who says he has faith but doesn't have works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. He says that wisdom is something that can be demonstrated. He says, you guys think you're wise? Really? You think so? Show me. Show me you're wise. It's not just the idea of knowledge and having this intellectual understanding about things. Because I'm going to tell you, whenever I was really young in the faith, I thought I was wise. I thought I knew a thing or two about the Bible. And meanwhile, my, my marriage life is in shambles. Meanwhile, things are broken around me. Meanwhile, I'm not exactly the best father. Wisdom's not just having knowledge, right? This intellectual pursuit. It's, it's behavior. It's how you act. It's implementing this knowledge in the way that you live before people, right? True wisdom can never be divorced from action because true wisdom is seen. It's evidenced by what we do, not what we know. Job 28 and verse 28 says this. Job says, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. It's doing. Why does Jesus finish his sermon this way? Do you remember the image he gives us in the Sermon on the Mount? What is it? He says in Matthew chapter 7, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and does it, will be like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain came down, and the rivers came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it did not collapse because its foundation was laid on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the rivers came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it collapsed 
and its fall was great. It's about what you do. And then finally, here's the secret, okay? When you ask the question, what is the personality of wisdom? James throws us a little bone secretly in the text because he says, you wanna know what the character of wisdom is? You wanna know what its personality is? In one word, it's meekness. Now, when you think about meekness, a lot of people don't know what that means, right? It was a character flaw in the days of Jesus. The Romans did not prize weakness. Why? Because for them, we, meekness was synonymous with weakness, right? Meekness is weakness. But you know, there's an interesting passage in the Bible, like this one, where it says, let his works be done, in verse 13, in the meekness of wisdom. There's this interesting case study in the Bible about a meek character. And the character that we learn about is this one in Numbers chapter 12 by the name of Moses. I think we all know Moses here. And in Moses chapter 12, <laughs> in Numbers chapter 12, when we look at Moses, what it says there in verse 3 is that Moses was the meekest man in the world. Now, it's kind of something when you think about Moses as the one who wrote the book, but it's inspiration, right? God just wrote, God just told him to write what to write, and he wrote it, right? So it must have been true. So Moses writes, he's the meekest man in the world. But do you know why? What do we actually read in the story that made him the meekest man? In Numbers chapter 12, Moses sort of shared the authority with these other two people who were his siblings, Miriam and Aaron. And it says that they were annoyed with the fact that he had taken to himself this wife. And so they begin to speak evil against them, and Aaron and Miriam are in this mutiny together, and they say, has the Lord only spoken by Moses? And they rise up and they, speak, they begin to speak evil against Moses. And you know what it says Moses did? Moses has the power. The text even goes on to say that, look, whenever I speak to a prophet, the Lord says, I show myself to him in visions, I speak to him in dreams, but Moses, not so. I speak to him face to face. He has seen my form. Moses could have obliterated them. He could have called down fire from heaven. He could have destroyed these, these, these siblings of his who were so traitorous in their actions. But what does he do? Moses does nothing. Moses doesn't act out against them. Moses doesn't beat them up. Moses doesn't speak a word against them. He humbly said nothing. He didn't even defend himself and instead allowed God to step in and defend him. And then whenever God does defend him and strikes Miriam with leprosy, he prays for Miriam. He says, oh God, let this not eat her up. Have mercy on her. Remove the leprosy. That lack of a need of self-defense is James's example of a person full of wisdom. It's meek. It's not aggressive. It doesn't have to defend itself all the time. It's the opposite of this inflated aggression. <laughs> this is something we need, brothers and sisters. I think about the image that God gives us in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Whenever God writes to Israel and he talks about their status before the nations, and, and really there's a parallel between the church and Israel since we're God's people today, God describes what the people were supposed to be to the outside nations, how the nations were supposed to look in and see his people. And one of the things he describes to them about themselves in Deuteronomy chapter 4 is he says this beginning in verse 5. He says, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for, here's what Moses says, for, that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples who, when they hear these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What nation is there that has a God so near to it as we do? The way that the people will see that we are the church, that we belong to Jesus, that there is something peculiar about us as a people, is not that we're entertainment driven, it's not that we're cool and we know the latest thing on Netflix. It's our wisdom. How else will people know that you're different when in a completely divided political sphere and in a divided culture, you're anxious and worried all the time about what other people are thinking? Oh, no, we got to say something offensive on Facebook because someone else said something offensive. Or what if you keep your head and you're level-headed, you're not anxiety-driven, what if that was peculiar in the face of people? What if you were a non-anxious present? Would then the culture see something different about the church? 
I want to tell you something, man. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you felt this way studying the text and learning about the meekness of wisdom in the character of Moses, but when James pushed my face into wisdom to understand what's happening here, to look in the mirror of Moses, I realized I don't got it. <laughs> I don't have that wisdom. And I scrawled in the margin of my Bible, God, make me this way, because I'm not. If you're feeling grief because you're not the way God wants you to be in the way that he's called you to be, if you feel aggressive and selfish and divisive, the good news is this, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And here's why. If you feel grief over your state, grief always precedes, always precedes repentance. And repentance always precedes revival and change. And if the church just for one moment can accept its sins and, and recognize and grieve over and lament over its sins and repent of those things, then maybe there can be revival and change for us. Maybe God will give us the spirit of power and of love and of self-control, not a spirit of anxiety and fear all the time. And if that leads you to pray and ask God to change you, well, then you figured out my next point. Point number two, Let's talk about the origin of wisdom and how we get it. All right, James chapter one this time, going back to the text. Now, I mentioned this in the 9 a.m. service because I, I explained why we're going back to James, but James is a wisdom writer primarily. I mean, it's almost like if you go back to Proverbs chapter two, for example, or really the entire book, it's almost like James had that open as he's writing his letter. But James jumps around these topics everywhere, and he mentions wisdom again. And I want to see if you can find the key phrase that attaches James 1, 17 through 19, page 1012 in your pew Bible, with James chapter 3, which we just read, okay? Here's what it says. I want to start reading in verse 17. Actually, verse 16. That fits better, I think. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, did you see where it connected? Do you see the phrase? We talked about in James 3, verses 13 through 18, this wisdom from above, right? That's his phrase, from above, from above. And now he talks about every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights. Wisdom comes from above. God is the source of wisdom, God. How does James describe God in verses, uh, verse 17? He calls God the Father, right? God is not just this distant deity, he's a father figure for us. And he says that God's this creator. He understands the world and how it works, kind of like a little bit our fathers understood a thing or two about how the world worked, you know, whenever we came into this world, right? He understands the world. He is light. In him is no darkness at all, First John 1 and verse 5 says. And he is the father of lights. God is the creator of the sun and the moon and all of the stars, these amazing balls of fire revolving in our galaxy. Psalm 74 and verse 16 says, yours is the day, yours is the night also. You establish the light and the sun. And whereas they may move, James says, whereas they're perfectly revolving and keeping everything in orbit, James says, God does not change. They may move, they may cast shadows, God doesn't do that. There is no variation in him. He's a pillar. He doesn't change. And so he can always be trusted to provide good. In fact, every good thing comes from him. And so does wisdom, James says. Now, just stop and think about that for a second. Okay. James, we want wisdom. It's totally out of our power to get it. It comes from God. What do we conclude from this? I think we also know where wisdom doesn't come from, right? For example, wisdom doesn't come from a fortune cookie. Agreed? Wisdom might not even necessarily come from age. H.L. Mencken once said, the older I grow, the more I distrust the familiar doctrine that age brings wisdom. We've always said wisdom comes with age, but sometimes age comes alone. 
And that's because growing old is mandatory, but growing up is optional. Wisdom is not a given. There is such a thing as adult immaturity. Break away with me to Job chapter 32. We're going to go to actually the set of wisdom writings in the Old Testament. We think about Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And Job is an interesting book, and in it, in this long poetry, one of the most beautiful books in the Bible, literarily speaking, Job gives us a picture into where this wisdom comes from. Notice what it says in Job 32. So just to give you a little bit of the context, Job is suffering, and his friends Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar come and rebuke Job because they think he's done something wicked to deserve the suffering from God. And this mysterious character, without any precedent, comes into the picture. His name is Elihu, and he's a young man. And what's important about Elihu is that if you notice at the very end of Job, when all of the characters are being rebuked, Elihu never gets a rebuke from God, not once. But here's what it says in Job 32, beginning in verse 6. And Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you're aged. Therefore, I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, let days speak, and many years teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. It is not the old who are wise, nor the aged who understand what is right. Therefore, I say, listen to me. Let me also declare my opinion. And then he goes on and gives one of the, probably the best answers that Job has heard in the midst of his suffering. We can't measure by our standards. Wisdom, yes, of course, if you're getting old, absolutely you want to be someone who's grown wisdom. But here's what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. Don't assume it comes naturally. It must be something worked at. It must be something begged for. It must be something sought in your life. Wisdom can belong to all because it is ultimately a gift of the giver. Stay there in Job. Turn over to Job 28. And notice what Job says about wisdom. Chapter 28, beginning in verse 20. You want to know the secret of wisdom? Here's what he says. Job 28 and verse 20. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of thunder, then he saw it and declared it, he established it and searched it out. And he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. Wisdom has never been a natural given to your age. It is something that comes from seeking the fear of the Lord. It comes from the origin and source, and that is God. And so as we wrap up the lesson, I have two questions, and that is this. How do we plug into it? If it comes from God, if that's how we get it, how do we plug into it? Notice what it says in our text. The first one, look in your Bibles, James, James chapter 1. I want you guys to see this for yourself. I'm not making this up. James 1 and verse 18. Where does it come from? Verse 18. Of God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James talks about this peculiar power of the word of God. That its ability always in the beginning, even with Genesis, let there be light and there was light, it has the power to create what it calls for. Do you know that you are saved, that you are a person made in the image of God, that you are brought into being by the power of God's word? How do you think we get wisdom then? It comes from God's word, as everything does. That we need to be going to the Bible, we need to be digging in our Bibles. Another year is coming up. Another year is coming up. And that'll be another year to read through our Bibles in, in a year. Have we done it? Have we ever done it? Have we ever just sat down and methodically with a reading plan, which we have plenty of in the foyer for your use, if you, have you ever just sat down and read through the entire Word of God and heard what he's had to say? You know, Mahatma Gandhi spoke forcefully to Christians. He was actually a fan of, of Christians, even though he, uh, he never became one. But Mahatma Gandhi once forcefully said this to Christians. Listen to it. He says, you Christians have in your keeping a document with enough dynamite in it to blow the whole of civilization to bits. 
to turn society upside down, to bring peace to this war-torn world. But you read it as if it was good literature and nothing else. I would only slightly amend Gandhi's comments by saying that it's not even like we read it as literature anymore even. It's not really like we read it at all. The iPhone has sought that. Are we digging in the word of God? Here's the second way we receive wisdom. Verse five, James chapter one, verse five. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Here's what he says, James one and verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. You want wisdom? Ask God for it. Go to God in prayer. You have but to go to the giver and ask for it. James says, interestingly, about God's character, this one who made the stars, the sun, the moon, the heavenly bodies to revolve, the one who had wisdom to create everything and give us life and our breath and all that kind of stuff. He says that he gives generously without hesitation. Do you know someone in your life who gives generously without hesitation? That you could ask something so audacious that they would say, yes, just, just, take, just take it. That's how God is. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't think, oh, I don't know, I don't really want you to be wise. He doesn't do that. He gives without hesitation. You know, one of the true marks of wisdom is knowing you don't have it because it's only when you go and pray and seek it that you begin to grow in wisdom. You think about the story of the boy Solomon, the wisest one ever upon the earth, save our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. First Kings 3, who grew into the man who wrote wisdom and, and Proverbs galore, who wrote the book of wisdom, right? How does he get it? He asked God for it. He prayed and God was delighted and pleased to answer that prayer. I know what you're thinking right now. Tyler, you had to have a sermon about that? You think I don't know that? Some of, you, some of you guys have, have this look of, 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 of exhaustion on your face. Like, yeah, prayer and Bible, I, I get it. That's, that's easy. I want you to listen to me very carefully about what I'm about to say. If we are patient in these disciplines, in studying the word of God in prayer, I promise you that you will increase in wisdom. You will be a fuller person. You will be able to navigate the high waters in your life. I know that it's cliche and it's tired and we've said it over and over and over again, but I think it's funny. You know, whenever we think about church growth, right? It's funny whenever you think about, as a church, all the things we do in America to just get people to come to church, right? All these things we do to get people to attend. We, we're more and more pressured to sell our souls to the world so that we get people to come to church, and that's just not what matters in this cultural moment. We have been operating off this idea that we're still living in this, in Christendom. We're not in a pre-Christian society. We're not in a Christian society. We are in a post-after Christian society. And Christians have to wisen up to what does it mean to be the people of God in that particular period and age. We might not feel it now, but listen to me. It is only a matter of time before the hands of the East and the hands of the West slowly make its way to the Midwest and wraps its hands around the neck of nominal, apathetic, in name only Christians and chokes them out. And it will come, it will come. And in that day, I wanna tell you something, people won't care how cool your preacher is. They won't care if he says things like, dude, that's dope, that's lit, man, that's off the hook. They're not gonna care about stuff like that. People won't care if your service has the feel of a concert and a TED talk, like every church we can think of today. And those who are true followers of Christ, even when it isn't cool, do you know what they'll be found doing? what they have been doing for thousands of years, they will be reading their Bible. They will be praying and seeking to implement the wisdom of Christ in their lives. It hasn't changed. And we may grow bored with that. We may not believe in that. But if we want to be the people of God, we will begin to lift up the word of God and pray through it. That is the sign of being God's people. And that is our wisdom before the world. 
especially the youth. Listen to me very carefully. Do you want to be on the cutting edge? You want to be different and countercultural? You want to change things? Don't drink the Kool-Aid of our society and, and just get swamped into the, the, just drowning in the mind-numbing spirit suppressing screen. Turn off your phone for a couple of seconds. Open the Bible, read it, and pray through it. The reason why we do this is because Paul promised us in Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 3, in Christ are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all in Jesus. And as we read through the text and as we pray through it, we hope that God would make us more like Christ in everything, knowing him, his person, his teaching, loyalty to him. If we want to be those people, we will come to Jesus. And if you're not a Christian this morning and you want that, we can help you with that as well by baptizing you into the waters for the repentance of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, that you might proclaim Christ as Lord. If you have any need whatsoever, please come right now while we stand and sing this song for your encouragement. Greetings, all